Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's IS exam prep and welcome to another video in our knowledge series. Now in this video we will be discussing about Election Commission of India. Election Commission of India is a constitutional body as per the provisions of Article 324. So as of now the current Chief Election Commissioner is Sri Rajiv Kumar and we also have an Election Commissioner Shri Anup Chandra Pandey. Now in the video we will discuss about how the commissioners are appointed, what is the term, the condition of service, what are the powers they have and what are the functions they perform. So let's begin our discussion. First up is the matter of appointment. Now Election Commission of India was established in the year 1950 on the 25th of January and you would also be aware that this date is celebrated as the National Voters Day all across the country since 2011. Now, Election Commission of India is a very small skeletal body and largely conducts the elections with the help of government officials who are transferred to Election Commission on deputation. Now, Election Commission of India, ECI, is a multi-member body. In fact, the constitution says that we will have one election commissioner who will be the chief election commissioner and we can have such other number of election commissioners as the president of India may determine. So, the appointment of the election commissioners is done by the president and when we say any person is appointed by the president, it comes under article 74 which means on the binding aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So, the appointment is done by the President of India. Secondly comes the composition. So, from 1950 till 1989, that is September of 1989, Election Commission of India was a single member body. But in 1989, two more people were appointed as Election Commissioners and the then election commissioner RVS Perisastri was made the chief election commissioner. These two people were SS Dhanova and VS Segal. Now new election commissioners were appointed and in the very same year towards the end of 1989 the president through notification removed the two posts and election commission of India came back to being a single member body. Now, V.S. Sehgal accepted the removal with grace, but Mr. S.S. Dhanova, he approached the court. He said that how can the president remove an election commissioner just through a notification? So, this matter went to court and the court clarified that the constitution provides for one person mandatorily. How many other people should be there is all up to the president. So, the other people, the number of members of election commission are to be determined by the president of India. And again, from January 1990 to September 1993, election commission came back to being a single member body, meaning just one person, the chief election commissioner. Now, in 1993, the government again appointed two more people, bringing back the total number of members of election commission to three, making it a multi-member body. At that point of time, the chief election commissioner was the very famous TN session. So, it was largely believed that the government wanted to curb the powers, clip the wings of TN session and that is the reason why the government made ECI a multi-member body. And not only this, it also made regulations stating that all decisions taken by the election commission. So, whatever decisions the election commission takes would be decided or would be taken by a majority vote. Meaning, all members will have the same power. So, it was very easy for other two members to always outvote the chief election commissioner, thereby curbing or limiting the powers of a single member body as the election commission was 
till 1993. And since 1993, till date, we have seen that election commission has been a multi-member body, a three-member body. So we have one chief election commissioner and two other election commissioners to form the election commission of India. Now, as far as these three people are concerned, one very important aspect that we should understand is the fact that when it comes to other conditions of service, other conditions of service are not mentioned in the constitution. There is a law in the country which is called the election commission conditions of service of election commissioners and transaction of business act 1991 which says that the election commissioners whether the chief or the other two members get the same salary as that of supreme court judge which is as of now 2.5 lakh rupees per mensum or per month so the salary of the chief election commissioner, the salary of the election commissioners is the same as that of Supreme Court judge, which is 2.5 lakh rupees per month. And when it comes to term of office, the members can continue to hold office till they attain the age of 65 or six years, whichever is earlier. And what is the qualification? There is no qualification mentioned in the constitution when it comes to the members of the chief or members of the election commission. Beyond this, as far as the service conditions are concerned, their salaries are concerned, the service conditions of the members of the election commission cannot be varied to their disadvantage while they are holding the post. Secondly, and very interestingly, because election commission of India is also seen as one of the four pillars of the Indian constitution, along with other bodies like the Supreme Court, the CAG, that is the Comptroller and Auditor General, the UPSC. So along with these three bodies, these four bodies are collectively known as the four pillars of the Indian constitution as Ambedkar has pointed out. Now, as far as CAG is concerned, CAGs are debarred from future employments under the government of India or government of state. But there is no such provision in the constitution which debars the retiring officials from any kind of future appointment. So once you retire as a member of the election commission, you are still allowed to or there is scope for you to be appointed as or at some government post. So this is with respect to conditions of service. What is to be noted is these conditions of service do not find a mention in the constitution. These are statutory provisions not mentioned in the constitution. Now beyond this, how about removal? Here also there is a big confusion. When it comes to the chief election commissioner, the chief election commissioner is removed in the similar manner to that of Supreme Court judge, meaning on like grounds, like manner. So what is the ground? Misbehavior or incapacity and the manner as mentioned under Judges Inquiry Act 1968, that is removal by the parliament with a special majority. And what is that special majority? The same kind of majority that is required to amend the constitution under Article 368, that is two thirds present and voting or more than 50% of the total strength. So this is how a chief election commissioner can be removed along the same lines as a Supreme Court judge, along the same lines as a High Court judge, along the same lines as a CAG, along the same lines as a state election commissioner. All these people are removed in the exact same manner. However, when it comes to the removal of the other election commissioners, the constitution is not clear as to what is the procedure. First up, it simply says, and this provision is under Article 324, Clause 5. So the constitution says that the removal can be initiated on the recommendation of the CEC. So we don't really know uh, what does this mean? because 
there are several questions. First things first, is the recommendation of the CEC to initiate the removal process binding? Secondly, is there any alternative? Is there any other way in which we can remove the election commissioners? Or what is the procedure to be followed? Let's say the CEC provides for or makes recommendation for the removal of the election commissioner. What steps need to be taken? How to remove the members is something where the laws have been largely silent. So there is a suggestion that since the election commissioners have the same kind of powers, have the same kind of salary, are appointed by the same authority, why don't we also make the conditions for removal same as the chief election commissioner. So the removal conditions for the election commissioners should be made similar to that of the chief election commissioner. This will avoid this very glaring loophole under the provisions of article 324. Now coming to the functions performed by the ECI. So what are the functions performed by election commission of India? First up, article 324 clause 1 itself says that the task of ECI is to prepare and revise, meaning update the electoral role. What is electoral role? It simply means the voter list. So the task of the Election Commission of India is to update the voter list regularly. Second, the same Article 324 Clause 1 also says that the conduct and supervision of all elections that is to the Lok Sabha, to the Rajya Sabha, to the Vidhan Sabha, the Legislative Assembly, the Legislative Council, the Presidential Elections, the Vice Presidential Elections. All these elections are to be conducted and supervised by the Election Commission of India. Barring the elections to local bodies, as far as local bodies are concerned, the election to local bodies is conducted by the state election commissioner. It is a constitutional body under the provisions of article 243 capital K. So when it comes to elections for panchayats, elections for municipalities, every state has to appoint somebody called a state election commissioner who is appointed by the governor and that person takes care of the local body elections. But for all other elections, it's the Election Commission of India. So we have a common machinery to conduct elections, both for center and states. Then, if you remember, there is also this Article 103. Now, as far as disqualification of our MPs is concerned or the MLAs, is concerned. There are various ways in which these MPs or MLAs, the legislators can be disqualified. For example, they can be disqualified on account of not being a citizen of the country. They can be disqualified on account of being of unsound mind. They can be disqualified if they go bankrupt. They can be disqualified with respect to office of profit. If they are found to be holding any post which is called an office of profit. All these matters where a sitting legislator can be disqualified are decided by the President of India. But these disqualifications, the decisions are taken by the President or the Governor respectively for MPs and MLAs, MLCs on the binding advice of Election Commission of India. So it is the Election Commission of India which decides on matters of disqualification and recommends to the president or the governor accordingly. There is only one aspect of disqualification and that aspect is the aspect of defection. With respect to defection, the decisions are taken by the respective presiding officers. Otherwise, on other matters of disqualification for legislators, the president or the governor decides on the recommendation of the 
election commission and that recommendation is actually binding okay now it is also the function of the election commission to fix the election program so what exactly do you mean by election program so when you see that elections are announced in any area in any state there is a proper pattern like you have your UPSC notifications the date the calendar is announced then the date of notification the forms are released there is a time frame within which you have to fill up the forms and then those forms are accepted or rejected and finally if you feel you have prepared enough you can go and take the examination similarly there is a entire program which is as per the provisions of RPA 1951 1 section 30 which talks about the election program so the election program starts with announcement who announces the election program the announcement is done by the election commission of India now within 21 days that is less than 21 days the president or the governor will issue a formal notification about the dates on which the polling will be conducted that's a formal notification which is issued by the president or the governor president with respect to the Lok Sabha Rajya Sabha the governor with respect to the Vidhan Sabha or the Vidhan Parishad then after formal notification has been done within seven days that is seven clear days of time is given for the candidates to file their nomination papers so the candidates will now file their nomination paper after filing the nomination paper one clear day of time is given for scrutiny the election commission officials posted across the country they will scrutinize the nomination paper nomination paper is just like you filling up your form for UPSC by submitting all details and all documents the same thing is done by all the people who want to contest elections they fill up all their details their assets liabilities their previous criminal history criminal antecedent their education qualification address etc after scrutiny two days of time is also given in case any member feels or any contestant feels that he or she is not willing to contest elections he is feeling too shy maybe I don't want to lie too much to public I don't have the skill to make false statements or whatever so you may take back your name that is what is called withdrawal withdrawal of candidature so your candidature can be withdrawn if you want to for example when you fill up a UPSC form if you have not prepared properly you may skip the prelims examination and if you skip it your attempt is not counted so the same thing and then at least 14 or more days of time is given for campaigns and then the polling begins once the polling begins the polling can continue in various phases depending on how big the area is and eventually the polling ends and we go for the declaration of result this is the election program all this is decided by the election commission of India right and one more point here there is something called model code of conduct basically it's a list of guidelines on how the political parties will behave in the run-up to the elections these guidelines have been arrived at by election commission in consultation with all the political parties so the model code of conduct comes into force from the date of announcement of the election and this model code of conduct continues to be in force right till the declaration of results so becomes applicable here and finally ends here okay so this is the election program fixing the election program is also one of the duties the functions performed by the election commission then obviously as I just said the election commission also prepares and revises the model code of conduct the MCC for parties and candidates and also to uh, tell you the model code of conduct is not legally binding though there could be some things some 
aspects of campaign which can be punishable under various laws, under various IPC sections. You can be punished if you try to insinuate people, create disharmony in the country based on class or caste or religion. But MCC or the Model Code of Conduct is not legally binding, it is just a set of guidelines and largely the political parties accept any punishment meted out by the Election Commission for the violation of the Model Code of Conduct. And that punishment can be very petty punishment. It's like, you know, the election commission can say, please don't campaign for two days, don't campaign for 24 hours, that's it. Nothing beyond that. Okay. Beyond this, you are very well aware that in our country, uh, it is, election is seen as a festival of democracy. And it is a humongous task to conduct elections in a free and largely fair manner. Free means freedom of choice. You are free to choose anyone and fair means equal chances of victory for all. So largely in a free and fair manner, in such a densely populated country, the elections are being conducted. And this is all thanks to the amazing performance of Election Commission of India and the bureaucrats and all the people involved in the conduct of elections. So Election Commission of India also runs an institute called Triple IDEM. India International Institute of Democracy and Election Management. And this is basically an institute which showcases various aspects of how the elections are conducted and also trains. Training is provided to election officials of other countries. So election officials of other countries come and attend sessions in triple IDEM and get trained on how to conduct elections in their respective countries. So this is also one function that the Election Commission performs. Beyond this, Election Commission also examines the accounts of expenditure submitted by candidates and not just candidates, also political parties. So every political party and the candidates have to submit the account of expenditure that they have gone through during the campaign period. If the political party wants income tax exemption under section 13 capital A of IT Act 1961, it has to submit the account of expenditure. So the regulations say that for the Lok Sabha elections, from the date of completion of elections, within 90 days, the parties should submit the entire account of expenditure. And when it comes to the legislative assembly, 75 days from the conduct of elections, the parties should submit the account of election expenditure and so should the candidates. Okay. Now, it also decides on the criteria for recognizing the political parties. What does this mean? Now, as far as political parties are concerned, political parties can be categorized along two lines. There are some parties which are called registered parties. They have been registered under section 29 capital A of RPA 1951, thereby being allowed officially to contest elections to take part in elections. And there are some parties which are unregistered. Now, since registered parties can contest elections based on their performance in the elections, the registered parties which have contested elections can be categorized into unrecognized or recognized political parties. Meaning, if you have performed very well, let us say you are somebody who has filled up the form, so people who have filled up the form and taken the exam, people who did not take this examination, difference. After you take the exam of UPSC, let's say you have performed well and you have cleared prelims or mains, you will be called prelims cleared, mains cleared aspirant. And if you have failed to clear it, then sadly, no appreciation. So based on the same kind of performance, the metrics are mentioned in the election symbols Reservation and Allotment Order 1968, what are the metrics based on which the various categorizations are done. 
recognized parties can be of two kinds national party which has met certain criteria of performance nationwide and then state parties so who decides the criteria the election commission decides the criteria and not only this the election commission also decides on issues with respect to mergers and split amongst the political parties so and all this is mentioned in the election symbols reservation and allotment order 1968 so based on the performance currently we have eight national parties parties like bjp congress bsp aitc that is trinamool congress cpi cpim ncp and a single party from northeast the national peoples party so these are the eight national parties and then we have over 50 53 state parties so all this criteria and the recognition the tag of whether you are a state party or a national party is given by the election commission of india beyond this it is the election commission which decides on what symbol to be allocated to which party and if there is any dispute with respect to a symbol which say more than one party is claiming it is the election commission which decides on disputes with respect to symbols as well and lastly election commission also looks into fixing the limit of the poll expenditure meaning there is a limit not for the parties but for the candidates that the candidates cannot spend over a certain amount in their constituency while they are campaigning for elections so for example we have something called rule 90 rule 90 under the conduct of election rules conduct of election rules 1961 and under this rule 90 the limit has been set that in case it's the lok sabha constituency then for larger constituencies a candidate cannot spend more than 90 lakh rupees and for a smaller constituency the candidate cannot spend more than 75 lakh rupees this limit earlier used to be 70 lakh rupees and 54 lakh rupees then last year it was increased to 77 lakh rupees and 59.4 lakh rupees and finally again in january 2022 this limit was further increased to 90 lakhs and 75 lakhs respectively for a larger constituency and a smaller constituency and for the legislative assembly this figure has again as i said recently been increased to 40 lakhs and 28 lakhs respectively for a smaller and a larger constituency which used to earlier be 28 lakhs and 20 lakhs which was increased to 30.8 lakhs and 22 lakhs and the current figure is 40 and 28 now let's say somebody crosses this limit exceeds the limit of expenditure what happens then under the provisions of section 10 capital a of rpa 1951 that person can be punished with disqualification so you can be disqualified from contesting elections for up to 3 years if you cross the election expenditure the poll expenditure limit and lastly just to clarify this poll expenditure limit is not for the political parties there is no upper limit to which the limit to which the political parties can spend they can spend an unlimited amount of money in the elections the cap is only for individual candidates who cannot spend beyond this limit in their respective constituencies while campaigning and this cap is again 
fixed by the Election Commission of India in consultation with the Government of India. So these are the functions performed by the Election Commission of India and this is all that you need to know as far as the constitutional body ECI is concerned. Now let us take up some questions that you have. Questions please. <clears throat> Shin Kumar, recently opposition parties have filed complaint against Draupadi Murmu to ECI for bribing the voters. What will be the possible course of action? See, as far as uh, uh, any kind of dispute, election dispute with respect to the presidential elections are concerned or the vice presidential elections are concerned, such disputes can be decided only if at least 20 electors raise a dispute, right? And this dispute needs to be raised in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has the original jurisdiction to decide on election disputes with respect to the presidential elections as well as the vice presidential elections under the provisions of Article 71 of the Indian Constitution. Ashutosh. No, Ashutosh, State Election Commissioner is an independent constitutional body under the provisions of Article 243K. They do not work as per directives of the ECI, not at all. Abhinay, uh, what makes the chief and the other commissioners different? See, as far as the chief is concerned, it is mandatory to have a chief election commissioner. It is not mandatory to have other election commissioners. The post of other election commissioners, whatever number it is, 2, 3, 10, 20, 100, is all decided by the president. Secondly, the chief election commissioner's removal is very, very difficult and independent because the person is removed in the same manner as Supreme Court judge. And so difficult is the process that not a single judge has ever been removed. Uh, whereas when it comes to the election commissioners, they can be removed on the recommendation of the CEC. Uh, further uh, process is not very clear as to how they can be removed. Asif, recommendations of ECI, as I said, the recommendation of election commission on disqualification of MPs with respect to certain provisions, which are mentioned under article 102, is binding on the president. The president, as per the provisions of article 103, has to act in accordance with the opinion or advice given by the election commission. So, yes, it is binding on the election commission. Uh, Vishnu Kumar, so can we hire ECI for conducting supervise any private elections for money, for example, union election, etc. Monetizing ECI. See, if you monetize ECI and hire a private body, uh, this could result in possibly uh, uh, an allegation of uh, being unfair. In fact, this is something which was thought of earlier during the making of this uh, constitution that should we go for a temporary election commission of India just before the elections why do not we form this body ECI, let them conduct elections and disband it. But the allegation was that the ruling party could get involved and could manipulate the members here, thereby also in turn manipulating the elections. So elections would not seem to be fair, even though they would be fair, it is more important that justice should be seen to have been done. God of MCC came into existence in 1974. Finally, in the 1960s only in some states like Kerala, the concept had already begun that the parties came together on an agreement that we will not misuse this festival of democracy. We will not create animosity. We will follow some basic guidelines, some ethical and moral conduct. And finally, in 1974, Election Commission of India came up with this concept that the political parties should behave in a very decent and cordial manner in the run-up to the elections and uh, there are guidelines for everybody, guidelines for candidates, guidelines for uh, the opposition members, guidelines for processions, guidelines for uh, manifestos, guidelines for social media regulations, guidelines for the political party in power that they should not misuse the position to manipulate elections to uh, appease the voter in favor of them. Ashutosh, sir, what is the issue related to star campaigner? Star campaigners are those people who are uh, chosen by the election commission, by the political parties 
uh, and they are the ones who are seen as celebrity vote seekers. So as far as the provisions of RP are concerned, section 77 says that a state or a national party, that means a recognized party can have up to 40 star campaigners. These star campaigners are basically people who are celebrities, vote seekers. Anyone can be made a star campaigner for any given duration in any specific area. And it depends on the political party completely on who can or who cannot be a star campaigner. So let's say the political party feels that Tushar Kapoor is a very famous person, they can make him the star campaigner in Maharashtra. They go to Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, they feel say Allu Arjun is a popular face, they can make him the star campaigner. They come to uh, say Tamil Nadu, they feel that say Surya or Vikram is a popular person, they can make him a star campaigner. They go to say Bihar, they feel uh, Ravi Kishan is a famous person, they can make him a star campaigner. They go to uh, uh, Kerala, somebody can make Fahad Fazil the star campaigner. It completely depends on the particular political party and election commission cannot interfere on who can or who cannot be a star campaigner. Right, this issue came up two years back in Madhya Pradesh when election commission started interfering and told Congress that you cannot have these people as star campaigners. Uh, that cannot be allowed. Star campaigners is a decision made by the party internally. And also, the star campaigners cannot campaign for a candidate. They campaign for the party in general. And that is why the expenditure on the travel of the star campaigner is not added in the expenditure made by the candidate. Uh, this on. Why many criminals in Lok Sabha? Criminals in Lok Sabha, now uh, that's a very strong word, accused in Lok Sabha. So as per the provisions of Article 20, we always say that you are presumed to be innocent uh, till I mean, you are always presumed to be innocent till you are proven otherwise. So why so many criminal cases against the members? That's true, uh, though in some cases, the criminal case could be criminal defamation or even small things like protests and all. So there can be a criminal case for that as well, possibly. But yes, we know there are almost 170 plus sitting legislators as of now in the country against whom there is a very serious accusation where the punishment could be as high as uh, uh, capital uh, punishment or the uh, life imprisonment. Now in that circumstance, uh, what can be said is that uh, when it comes to the people who are voting, if the political party realizes that whether this person has a criminal history or not, eventually the people are going to vote for him, then why not? The political party will keep on giving ticket to the person and until and unless people change their behavior, people change their voting habit, people refuse to elect such candidates, the political parties will continue to give tickets to such people. So uh, and as far as uh, the accused are concerned, if you are convicted of uh, uh, any kind of crime, we already have provisions under uh, section 8, 1, section 8, 2, section 8, 3, section 9, section 9A, 10, 10A of RP 1951 for disqualifications. And uh, last question. What is the order of precedence for ECI? Uh, order of precedence for ECI meaning who is a senior person? So order of precedence for ECI could mean that the chief is the senior most person though all of them share equal powers. Okay, so I believe that's all as far as the questions on election commission of India are concerned. That's all for this video. Jai Hind.